Hi, this is Stephen Gregg again, and I'm here to tell you the rest of my story. Like I've been talking about, um, you know, the message is the mindset of a trailblazer. So I'm kind of just going through my life and telling you all about uh, what's happened in my life because I believe um, throughout this message you're going to get a lot of little inspirational tips and things that I've experienced that I believe that can really help you in your life in so, so many ways. And this recording is raw, it's real. Um, there's really no editing in it. I'm just talking from the heart and just telling you who I am and, and um, what I've lived so that hopefully one person that's watching this or many people that's watching this or millions of people around the world um, that see this video get to um, experience it and be able to use it in their life. So I'm just kind of breaking it down piece by piece. So this I think is section three. Let me look here. Um, yeah, this, no, this is actually part four. I think it is. Part four of my message. Uh, my story okay I just let me make a note here so this is part four so I was going through last time about some of the crazy things I did I talked about um, that I had a you know this this stuff called derma shield I put on my hands and and you know you know this acid test I, I tested myself with back in the day it was kind of crazy and the diet cookies um, but there was a lot more um, that after I you know left Circuit City uh, I started trying out, trying to really build this enterprise, this, this enterprise system that I had created, this big community center that I had talked about that I was going to really save the world. That pretty much what it was. We're going to help the kids. We're going to help the adults. We're going to help the teachers. We're going to help the, the neighborhoods, the community. Because of the video that I watched called Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. And after watching that video, you have no idea what it did inside me. I mean, it turned my heart like... Like nothing else, I, I can't even explain it. It just, I just was zeroed in, laser-like focus. That's all I could think about. That's all I could see. That's all I could talk about. Of course, in the middle of all my partying and dancing and stuff. But, but, but as far as business, that was all I wanted to do was just go and accomplish that dream. And so there were some other dumb things I did trying to raise money. Because remember, like I said, I had no money and no skill set, no family members, no support, no girlfriend at that point, no, no nothing. I had nothing, no family members or, or financial means whatsoever, nothing to support me to build this um, gigantic um, dream that I had. So I met, I met a friend of mine, his name was Joe, Joe Jackson. Um, actually, let me talk about the one before that, which is um, I uh, went and sold to, with a company called Hunter Heritage. Hunter Heritage back then was in Torrance. And when I went there, they had this antimicrobial soap. And this soap was supposed to be this phenomenal soap that could kill, you know, kill all the germs in your hands and all that stuff. And, and so we thought, well, you know what we could do? We could put this in some, they had put it in some hair care stuff, some hair care products. And I went around hair salon to hair salon, probably two or 300 hair salons at that time, and got them all signed up to take this, this hair product that had this antimicrobial soap that's supposed to be really good for the hair and everything else. And I sold it to all of them, got them all ready to go, and then this product did not come out. And because it didn't come out, I had worked for six straight months with no money. And that was when I, my car got repoed. Um, it was a bad situation. It was one of my favorite cars, my Ford Pro, uh, you know, got taken away. Because, you know, I couldn't work. And so I was really discouraged at that time. Really depressed, really down and uh, upset. Because I lost everything again. So then that's when I defected and went out and moved to Orange County. Um, I actually met a girl out here at a nightclub called, uh, um, I forgot the name of it. I forgot the name of the club, but I was out here and I met her and we started dating and I moved out this direction in San Jose, I'm, I'm sorry, in um, Orange County because, you know, again, chasing a girl like I did to get out to LA in the, first, in the first place. But there was some other products that came about from Hunter Heritage. There was another product called, um, it was a, that same antimicrobial soap. Um, we were going to take it to um, the pharmaceutical industry. So I got together with a guy who worked at a, his name was Tony, uh, and we went to a company that was um, called Mitsui. And Mitsui and I and, and Tony, we were going to take this to the pharmaceutical industry. So they had people testing it, and it was it was proven to work, and it was supposed to be the best hand soap they had ever seen because it was gentle, wouldn't hurt the skin, but it would you know kill all the germs, and hospitals could use it, and we were going to get it worldwide. So I took that product there, and we and we had it all set up, ready to go. And then, uh, of course, um, someone, they stole the patent from the manufacturer of the product and they made it themselves and they didn't need the company. So, again, I lost, you know, an opportunity to make millions again. So, these are these, these little stepping stones. So, I was like inches from success. 
And that's the title of this lesson today, Inches from Success. I was all, always right there, you know, right up against the success I needed to build this big enterprise program. So then after that, you know, again, all my friends and family are now thinking I'm a lunatic because I've lost everything, I've sold everything, I've moved out of the town, I've, I'm just going after my dream like with reckless abandonment and just going out like a nutcase trying to accomplish this big dream because I had this big dream that I believed in. I, I wanted to help my people. You know, it said, um, you know, countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys. I wanted to save black boys. That was bottom line what I wanted to do. I wanted to save black boys. Now, of course, now I want to save everybody. It doesn't really matter what nationality, boy or girl you are. Um, I, I want everybody to be saved. So does the Lord. But the bottom line is that that was my heart at the time. I wanted, you know, to, to help my people. So I met another guy out there. After I moved to LA, Orange County, I met another gentleman named Joe Jackson. I met Joe Jackson because I started going to inventors conventions where people have inventions but they don't have money or maybe they have money and they're looking for inventions or they have the expertise but they don't have the money or inventions and they need to put it all together. So because at that point I had amassed a, a, an array of, of, of a network, a, gr a good group of people that had money or they had the skill set to build it or they had manufacturing. I had all those things. What I didn't have is the product. So I went to an inventors convention looking for products. But when I went there, because I figured if I mix the two together, the product and the uh, money, and I can work out a deal with each side, I could get a percentage of each one of those deals. So that's exactly what I did. And so I went to these inventors convention, I met Joe Jackson, and Joe Jackson told me that he had invented something very unique. And I kind of blew him off because he was a little scraggly guy, older guy, didn't look like he knew what he was talking about, but he kind of pinned me down and said, Stephen, I want to talk to you about what I have. I said, okay, what do you got? He goes, I invented a timer. And I said, okay, so what's so unique about that? He said, well, it's the timer that's on the VCR. And I said, you mean you've invented something like the timer? He goes, no, I invented the timer that's on VCRs. Now, remember, we're like 92 at this point, 93. He goes, I invented the timer that's on VCRs. And I said, you mean on all the VCRs? Or like on one VCR? He goes, no, like on all the VCRs. I invented it. Here, let me show you. He showed me an article that in the 70s, he had invented this timer. And he had presented to, to Sony and Sharp and JVC and all these major manufacturers this timer that he um, had invented. And it was in the LA Times newspaper showing that he invented it. He had the whole patent and the product right there. But none of these companies wanted to buy it from him. Uh, probably because he was, you know, African-American man or, you know, that's what they called him. A uh, Hebrew man, in my opinion. But he was a man that, you know, they, they didn't want to do business with. So they, they kind of stole it from him. And they built it on the VCRs anyway. So he goes, Stephen, so I have this, this patent. He goes, I said, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Help you get it built? He goes, no, not really. He goes, I actually have a lawsuit against Sony, Sharp, JVC, Magnavox, Mitsubishi, and Mitsui. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and, um, and Magnavox. And I would like to get an attorney that can sue them. Because here's the proof. He showed me this big old stack of papers, and it was a lawsuit against all those manufacturers. Because come to find out, he was entitled to $13 for every VCR ever created up until from, from the year 2000, um, 1990, 1986 all the way until 2000 and, or, or 1992 or 91, right around the time I met him. And I was like, wow, that sounds pretty good. So you know what I could do? How about I find you an attorney? If I find you an attorney, what would you do? He goes, I'll pay you 10% of the lawsuit. I said, great. I said, what's the lawsuit do you think it's worth? A couple hundred million dollars? He goes, no, about $13 billion. And I was like, $13 billion, 10%? That's not like a fair trade-off. Let's do it. So we wrote up, <laughs> it's crazy. We wrote up this agreement. And so when I went to work on my, my team and found an attorney. Now, I didn't find just any attorney. I found a guy named Don Busby. Now, Don Busby, he was the attorney, one of the attorneys <clears throat> on the Watergate case. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this was not a little attorney. This was not some guy in the building over there. He lived in Texas. He flew out to Texas. We met at the John Wayne Airport in Orange County. And we met there and we showed him the lawsuit. We sat down before we even got into the hotel. He had saw the validity of this lawsuit. And he said, I'm in. And matter of fact, I'm in. It's going to take about a million dollars to put this, court in the ca this case in the court. But I'm not going to charge you a penny. I'll take a contingency. I'll do it on contingency and I'll, I'll um, get paid after the fact. That's how valuable this court case is. Great. So we signed the agreement with Don. I got my agreement with Joe. I'm sitting back. I'm like, it's on like Donkey Kong, man. I just knew it was all done, 
right? So, so this uh, Don starts going after it, and then he starts going after it, and now I'm the communicator between Don and Joe, because Joe was street. I mean, this brother was street. He he didn't speak the the language that an attorney would like to hear or that an audience would like to hear. You know, but I can understand it because I'm street. I can talk to anybody. It don't matter to me if you broke as a joke or if you're a rich, you know, tycoon. I, we can talk. I can relate to everyone in the middle. And so I would talk to Joe. And told, Joe would tell me something or ask me something, and I related. I three way it over to um, to Don. So I'm the middle man between the two. I'm communicating what Don says and articulated that jargon and I um, get it back to Joe and I share it with Joe and so that went on for about a year and I remember I was sitting in the bed I remember like the, like it was you know last week I was sitting in the bed um, I was living in uh, Orange County in the city of Orange on La Vida Street in the apartment with my ex-girlfriend uh, Peaches at that time <laughs> to be exact her name was Elizabeth but we called her Peaches and so I was sitting in the bed late, just sitting there during the day and I get a call from from Don Busby. Don Busby said, Stephen, I got some great news. I was like, what's that? He goes, man, we got a Korean manufacturer of VCRs that have looked at your case and were, are willing to testify in court against all these other manufacturers that yes, you did, they did infringe on that patent. I said, phenomenal. I said, what does that mean? He goes, that means it's a done deal. I said, what do you mean it's a done? He goes, you don't understand. When a manufacturer can say that it's been infringed on, then there's no better proof than that. And I said, man, that's awesome, great, let me call Joe and tell Joe. So I hung up with Don, I called Joe up, said, hey Joe, I got some phenomenal news. He goes, what's up Steve, what, what you got? And I told him what happened, I said, Don Busby um, just says this deal is in the bag, it, it, it's a wrap. He goes, man, what, what happened is, we um, have a, a, a manufacturer, a Korean manufacturer, and they're willing to come into court and testify that they absolutely have infringed on your patent. And so there's no money you have to spend, there's nothing. They're willing to come on their own fruition, their own dollar, because Don, I'm sure, is gonna hook them up or something, I don't know, but they're coming on their own dollar to come and testify against all of those manufacturers that they infringed. We have won, this case is done. Joe says to me, Stephen, I got some bad news for you. I was like, okay, what's the bad news? He goes, well, I'm gonna fire Don Bugsby. I was gonna, you're gonna fire, I, you know, I felt like the guy from Home Alone. Ah, right, I, I felt like that. I said, you're gonna fire Don Busby. Why are you gonna fire Don Busby? What's the reason for that? He goes, cause it's taking too long to get into court. I said, taking too long to get into court? See, he's only had it for a year. He goes, yeah, but my court case, my court, my, my patent expires in like four years, and so we need to get this thing done. I said, I just told you. He's going to the court. We have a manufacturer that's willing to testify that all these other manufacturers have infringed on your patent. We already have it signed. It's already done. They're willing to go. He goes, Stephen, it's, it's too late. I'm already contracting with a different attorney. He's a black attorney out here in Los Angeles. He's going to get in the court in a week. And I said, Don's going to get in the court in a month, but he has a manufacturer to prove that you've done it. He goes, Stephen, I, I don't know what to tell you, bro. It's, it's all done. Well, I'm, I'm going to go with this black attorney. I kind of trust him. I know him better. I said, I said, Joe, I'm going to tell you right now something. I'm going to tell you something from the heart, bro. This is the stupidest decision you're ever going to make in your entire life. And you are going to regret this decision for your entire life. I said, I can't do anything. I mean, is there anything? Can I hook you up with Don? Can I get you guys together and talk? He goes, no, man, it's already done. We're in court next week. It's already signed, sealed, and delivered. I was like, okay, okay. And I hung up the phone. I called Don and told him Don the story. Don was, of course, upset because he had already spent 100 grand of his own money on this case. And so what ended up happening, Joe went to court with this attorney, and he had a stack of papers about this thick to prove the case. The manufacturers, Sony, Sharp, JVC, and Magnavox had a stack of papers about this thick, or each of them, proving that they didn't. Because there was no eyewitness, there was no proof that they manufactured. Courts don't read all those documents. They just look and see who has the biggest stack or the most proof. And they had the most proof. So because they couldn't judge beyond a reasonable doubt, they had to throw the case out. Don lost the case, I mean, um, Joe Jackson lost the case. 
and in about an hour, they were out of that court case, courtroom. And the attorney said, I'm sorry, man, this, I, I don't know what happened, I don't know what happened. And Don just put it, I mean, Joe just put his head down and said, I should have stuck with Don. And he called me a couple weeks later, and um, that was a really sad time for me, because, I mean, his brother could have been free. He could have been free. His family could have been free. You know, I could have been free. I could have saved, built those ICANN projects that time. That was probably one of my biggest blows at the time, financially. Um, that one devastated me. And I talked to Joe for many, many, many years after that. And every single time he saw me, he said, Stephen, I should have stuck with Don Busby. And it made me tear up every time, just like it's doing right now. You know, I was, I was sad because I can't even imagine how many lives would have been changed if Joe would have followed my instruction, would have listened to me, would have allowed me to do what he, he paid me to do, and would have, uh, you know, trusted the white man. That was his phrase, the way he used to phrase it, about Don. He would have trusted a guy that, that wanted to help him, that put his own heart and money and soul behind it. Sometimes we, we uh, put our personal issues in the way of our common sense. And I think that's what Joe just did that day. He put his own personal um, negative issues about race or, or you know, stupidity to, to try to help the brother out. You know, that was his mindset. I'm going to help the brother out, the brother attorney, versus doing what made sense. You know, you can't make, if it, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And what he did didn't make sense. And not only did it affect him, it affected me. It affected, uh, I could say at this point, looking back, hindsight is 2020. That one decision affected millions and millions and millions of people. Because I know what I would have done with my portion. I would have built those ICANN centers. People would have been off the street. Um, people's lives would have been changed. The children around the world would have been inspired and motivated and, and would have believed in themselves. And teachers would have learned how to teach the kids that are in the inner city. And the parents, there would have been a lot of parents that would have done, you know, the, probably the right thing because of, of the leadership and the people I would have brought into that event. I would have done it right. That was my mission. It's still my mission. And I'm on that mission right now. It's going to still happen. It just happened a different way. God had a different plan because, you know, sometimes God, God we, we make our plans, but God directs the way they're going to go. You know, and, and he, he had a plan. And I had a plan. But, you know, sometimes people can come in and, and infect that plan. And that's what Joe did. Joe infected that plan and, and changed the course of that plan by a, a decision made by emotion versus by logic and making sense. But God still has that same plan right now, you know? That's what these videos are about. You're going to hear as we keep going, we get to the next video, you're going to hear more stories because <laughs> here's the hilarious part. Right after I was done with Joe, his son was a genius too. And, and me and his son did some big things together too. And I'll tell you that story next on the next video. But I just want you guys to know that, you know, your past doesn't equal your future. I wish I would have told Joe at that time that the things that happened to him when he was, he was young, um, you know, the stuff he saw in the 40s and 50s by the people that, you know, that beat us down and, and sprayed us with water and all the stuff that happened over those years. Your past doesn't equal your future. Everybody's not like that. And I hope you that are watching this video don't judge um, a book by its cover. I hope you don't judge a, a person by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, by who they are today and, and how they respect you. Not based on their religion or their beliefs or their, their background or what ch choices they make in their life unless they're not going in the right direction. I hope you make sound decisions based on the character of the, of the person and who they are and, and what they can do and, and what you can do with them. And if they're trustworthy or they're honest, they have respect, they love the Lord. Or even if they don't, if they are respectable, good people, I hope you make decisions based on that, not based on your past. Because your past doesn't equal your future. And when you allow it, it could devastate many. Just like Joe's decision did. So, I just wanted to share that message with you today. I got a lot more, man. You guys have no idea how many videos I'm going to be sharing. This is just, I think, number four of um, part four of this, this whole uh, life story. 
you know, the mindset of a trailblazer. And, uh, I hope you be, come back with me next time. Tomorrow I'll be shooting another video. Every single day I'm shooting another video. One on top of each other. This building on top of the story. I hope you watch all of them. Um, I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much for your time. I love you guys and you guys have a blessed day.